brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. Today, as we return to our studies, we will open the word of the Lord. We will look to see what the prophets have said that are more for our time than for theirs. As I've stated before, <clears throat> all of these items that we look at, I take very personally. I am not attempting to point fingers at anyone. All, all of these items I look as being directed to me. So shall we ask our Heavenly Father's guidance as we open these words so that we may truly come to an understanding of what he would have us to know for this time? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you for the blessing of the Sabbath, the blessing of fellowship, the blessing of your word, and that that you would have us to understand at this time. Please direct us, Father. May your angels guide us. May your spirit be with us in this meeting. Help us so that we may truly come to understand that which you need us to know. And may these words of warning have the necessary effect upon our hearts, upon our actions, and upon our characters. Direct us now. Please be with us. So that what we understand, what we read, what we comprehend, may help us to give the message that you would have given to this world at this time. We thank you that there are more than two that are gathered here today. For we know that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. We need you. We need your spirit and we need your guidance. For this, we thank you. And for this, we praise you in Jesus' name. Well, Amen. the time must be just this week. Excuse me, Tom, what was that? Oh, sorry. I didn't know the mic was on. It's all right. As I had been preparing for these presentations, there are some documents that had have been popping up. So before we return to Isaiah 59, we're going to go through an unpublished document, some of which was used in the devotional Today with God. But it's interesting that this document, as so many others, have other copies with handwritten interlineations that the White Estate has chosen not to publish. As the children of Israel, God's favored people, persisted in impenitent rebellion, notwithstanding the warnings and reproofs he had sent them, he challenged them to prepare to meet their God. Is this not the condition we find ourselves in today? It is. By his appointed agents, he had sent them message after message, which they had only despised and rejected, and now they must prepare to meet his retributive judgments. They would not prevail against him, for, lo, he that formeth the mountains, and createth the wind, and declareth unto man 
what is his thought that maketh the morning darkness and treadeth down the high places of the earth. The God of hosts is his name, Amos 4.13. As an offended judge, the Lord would execute his judgments upon his impenitent people. If they would escape his vengeance, they must humble them, their hearts and confess their sins. Let's remember that this was written 124 years ago. So this was first written February 16th of 1899. The lesson is for someone else, right? This lesson is for us. 124 years after Mrs. White wrote this, this lesson is for us. If the church does not wish to accept this, We must take this lesson and apply it in our lives today. The Lord has a people on the earth, but the precious wheat is mingled with tares. Both must grow together until the harvest. Mere professors of religion are found among the followers. These will be among the first who will feel the wrath of an offended God. While God is purifying to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, Satan is binding up the tares in close connection with himself. Where does judgment begin? As we find in the letters of Peter and as we find in the prophecies of Ezekiel. Judgment begins at the house of God. Amen. The war instituted against principalities and powers, against spiritual wickedness in high places, cannot be avoided. A probation has been granted us by God to make our calling and our election sure. Does this state that there is predestination? Or are we in a probationary time where we may choose who we will serve? The latter. We have been given time, precious time, to critically examine our own hearts and compare our characters with the pattern that is given to us to copy. We shall not be excusable if we meet the world's standard. The world cannot now understand the true follower of Jesus or judge his works any more than it could understand Christ or judge his works. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. The world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Salvation is a gift that is freely given. Salvation is a gift that many will choose to reject. Why? Why will they choose to reject the gift of salvation? There's a cross to bear. How did the Savior state this? If you love me, Keep my command. Exactly. How many are there that believe that their salvation is found in their membership of a group 
rather than in studying for themselves to keep the commandments of God. We are in no wise safe while professedly serving Christ and in reality serving the world. The condition of things marked out in prophecy exists and is endangering the purity of our faith. There are multitudes who are called Christians who know not Christ by an experimental knowledge. They do not walk in his statutes. They do not desire knowledge from the Most High. Their hearts go after their idols. Their hearts go after worldly gain and worldly honor and sensual pleasure. These objects are eagerly pursued. Hardness of heart, impenitence, depravity, enmity exist among a large number who profess to be Christ followers. These, by their unsanctified spirit, are working the works of unrighteousness. This is the reason that God does not reveal himself in power. Self is served and self is worshipped. The passions of the human heart are petted and excused. We are not able to serve God and man, are we? Now, I find it very interesting that the condition of these things are marked out in prophecy. If we are setting aside the prophetic message, are we not asleep to what is happening around us? Is prophecy a part of the gospel? Absolutely. Those who do not the works of Christ hate self-denial and piety. We're given a choice. Are we willing to deny self? Are we willing to walk in the path of the Savior? Or are we going to do what the world sees as being right? By their course of action, they will influence and deceive souls who, if not deceived by these agents of Satan, would walk in obedience to the plainly specified command, he that will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So shall he be my disciple. Here we are to see Luke 3, 9, 23, excuse me. The soul of those led from simplicity of the gospel, from the self-denying life of a Christian, will be required at their hands. Our conduct, our sentiments must be conformed to the divine standard. And constantly we must pray for heavenly illumination and sanctified judgment that we shall not err from God's precepts. Every church needs to bring forth fruit, meat for repentance. Does this say that only the Seventh-day Adventist church needs to bring forth this fruit? It says every church. Every meeting of the movement needs to bring forth fruit that shows that we are repentant of our sins. God makes his presence and his will known to his people through appointed ministers who are walking in the light. He has 
channels through which he can communicate light. Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. Amos 3, 7. God does reveal his secret purposes to his chosen agents, whose duty it is to declare the same to his people, that they may take warning and turn from a course which will surely bring the wrath of God upon them. He sends reproofs and warnings that they may turn to him, that his wrath may be turned away, and his approval rest upon them. But often the perversity and stubbornness of the human heart leads men to refuse the light because it does not harmonize with their ideas. They know that if they receive the light, they would have to repent and be converted. They justify their own deceptions and do not correct their ways. The way that Mrs. White wrote this, I see a great support for the studies that we have been doing upon the reform lines. Me I see, too. I see a huge support for what we have been learning from the book of Judges. How many who seem to run well for a time have been led into correction with the world and as a result have separated from God? Connection with the world. Connection with the world. You're right. Excuse me. When we are connected to the world, are we connected to God? No. No, sir. One of the blessings that I enjoyed this week was going back through many of the studies from the Oklahoma camp meeting. It was interesting for me to see so many of these names, so many of these parties that in 2010 seemed to be so on fire for this message and that now have chosen their connection with the world over their connection with God. How many of these will not speak again in reference to this message? As those who are inclined to worldliness indulge their selfish inclinations, they go farther and farther from the light. It matters not whether we're talking about the greater light of the Bible, or as Mrs. White called her own writings, the lesser light. If we go farther and farther from the light, what are we choosing over the light? Ourselves. Are we not choosing darkness rather than light? And yes, I agree. Yes. We are choosing ourselves. Are we? Are we not darkness? Yes. They do not love the light reflected upon them through Christ's appointed agencies. What is it that reflects the light? A mirror. Does not the moon also reflect the light? Oh yeah. Several it's years called the lesser ago. light. Exactly. Several years ago, I sat in a house where we were having a Bible study. And the sister that was prepared for the study was doing an excellent job. But I asked her very directly, could you 
show that Ellen White was a prophet from the Bible. She looked at me and she said, well, yes, given a few hours, I could I could probably puzzle that out. And, you know, maybe maybe in a week or so I could have it ready to present. I looked at her and I said, I think we could do it in five verses. And it was amazing to me when you when you look at this and you open this up, how using the Bible alone, we could show that not only was she a prophet, but she was reflecting the light of Christ's righteousness. They hate both the message and the messenger. The most strenuous efforts will be made by this class to pervert the understanding of Christ's ministers that the voice which God would use to reprove their course of evil may be intimidated and silenced. Thus they add sin to sin. They engage in Satan's work and maintain an obstinacy that resembles the fruit born of a corrupt tree. <clears throat> Some churches are much affected by this influence. It is like the leaven which leavened the whole lump. The Lord cannot much longer endure these workers of iniquity. He will expose them because they disgrace the religion of Christ. Our God is a jealous God. He will not always bear with the perversity of men. He is committed to his Israel the most sacred truth ever committed to mortals. He has made his people the repositories of his holy law, that the light of his truth may shine forth to those who are living in the darkness of the errors of this evil time when iniquity abounds. God has blessed his people with light and with privileges, as no other people have been blessed. What a statement is that for us today? If their works and their influence correspond with their profession, they will be trees of righteousness, bearing fruit to the glory of God. But because God has shown them favor by committing to them his oracles, he will in no wise excuse in them disrespect and disregard of his requirements. If found in sin, this highly favored people will be punished with as much greater severity than the common sinner as their, as their advantages and opportunities have been greater. God will never connive at wickedness in any shape. Much less will he spare those in responsible places who have used common fire in place of the sacred. Here we have an example and we have an admonition. I would use an example that Miller's rules of biblical interpretation are as the sacred fire where the apostates would choose to use the common fire as presented by man. Understanding and light that comes from Miller's rules helps us to grow, helps us to understand, and the other removes our understanding. None can connect with God and work in harmony with him, have friendship with him while working contrary to his plainly expressed will. He declares, 
them that honor me, I will honor. First Samuel 2.30 Those who will not listen to the words of instruction given them by his appointed agents, whose hearts rise up against his counsels, who vindicate and justify their own course of action, show by their fruits that they are not doers of the word of Christ or lovers of the law of God, but are lovers of themselves. They are proud, boastful, heady, high-minded lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. Indulgence in any wrong course blinds the understanding and hardens the heart against justice and mercy. How truly has this been revealed by the arbitrary exaction manifested, the desire to domineer and lord it over God's heritage. The Lord addresses such in words of irony, fitted to them in their present state. Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgressions. And bring your sacrifices every morning and your tithes after three years, and offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven, and proclaim and publish the free offering, for this liketh you, O ye children of Israel, saith the Lord God. Amos 4, 4 and 5. Serve you every one his idols, and hereafter also, if you will not hearken unto me, but pollute ye my holy name, no more with your gifts and with your idols. Ezekiel 20, 39. Sometimes I think that Mrs. White is being kind to say that these are words of irony. Sometimes I think we have to take a look that these may be descriptions of exactly what's going on. The people so mercifully granted every temporal and spiritual advantage have not responded to God's tokens of mercy and love. The Lord is indignant with them and rebukes them sharply for neglecting to heed his warnings. He gives them to understand that he cannot manifest himself to them, but will be obliged to give them up to strong delusions as a just punishment for their abuse of his means of grace, so long offered and rejected. Their offering sacrifice to him and then to their idols was an affront to his name. In his abhorrence of their course of action, he bids them follow their beloved idols and bear the consequence of their perversity. Those thus addressed were not heathen, but the professed people of God who condemned the worship of idols made of wood and stone Yet by following their own devices and walking in their own ways, they were daily committing adultery, idolatry. They were exalting self and dishonoring the God of heaven. Can we not see that idolatry is the same to God as adultery? Amen. In being a Christian, in taking the name of Christ, are we not entering into a covenant relationship akin to marriage? No form of worship, no religious service can supply the want of reconciliation with God. 
The regenerating grace of Christ is necessary in order for men and women to abide in Christ and work the works of Christ. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Amos 3, 3. The Lord has a controversy with his people in these last days. Who please self? Who serve the world? Who serve flesh and serve the devil? Their influence endangers the church of Christ. Yet those who bear testimony against them are derided and their words are despised. But God will work through his ministers as he worked through Moses. He will ratify in heaven their judgments and decisions. And at the last great day will produce these decisions. Do we wish to be those whose influence endangers the church of Christ? Or do we wish to walk humbly before our Lord? I find it interesting in her choice of words, um, the word ratify. Yes. He will ratify in heaven their judgments. Uh, my understanding of the word ratify means that um, whatever judgment we make, um, they have to be ratified by not necessarily judgments, but laws that we make right. are ratified by our Congresses, whether they're state or Senates, by uh, whether they're state or federal just an interesting word just an observation right so in this situation when we're looking at ratify here is this not confirming the validity of those judgments and decisions that's what it sounds like to me okay i and think there's some also some other ratification going on uh uh Brother Theodore had made a comment earlier about um, something, a mistake that might have been made in the past okay. uh, in relationship to doctrine and um, or time. I think it was timing is what it was. It was timing. And he made the comment about um, God would use that. Uh, not good decision as a good decision and which we've seen in the past, you know, uh, accidentally we come across things and we were saying they were something else. And now we find that they're this thing as opposed to that thing that we thought of before. It's kind of got me into that thought of the ratifying. Um, when you just said that, or when, when I read that word in that particular sentence or paragraph, I mean, a good point men who are determined to do as they please will despise and will reject the counsels of god against their own souls we've spoken often of what happened in newport in 2012 There have been many that have spoken out against the use of the charts and against Miller's rules. Are these not despising and rejecting the counsels of God? Uh, yes, and it, it makes me um, sympathetic to them i mean it, it, it awes me when they make these statements it, it it i don't know why but i get kind of jumbly inside um it's kind of like a fear that i've developed i get when i get scared i get i get uh 
jumbly inside. And, and I don't necessarily mean get scared personally, but get scared for things or for people or for an object. Like I seen a deer in the road and got that same that was, you know, dying or dead on the side of the road. I right. got that same feeling, you know. God will give them up to their own lusts and idols. Do we want to find ourselves in that situation? Do we wish this to be our situation today? He will receive none of their service, but will pronounce sentence against them as against the barren fig tree, saying, let no fruit grow on thee henceforth and forever. Matthew 21, 19. Their condemnation will be irrevocable. Although they may bear the name of Christian and go through a form of service, none but God may know their true state, but he searches all things. No rank or office in the church or in society can place men where the truth will not reach them. If they neglect their duty and abuse their opportunities, those who lead people to exalt self place Christ in the background. They do not fear the threatenings of God or seek his favor. They hate the light. They despise the faithful preachers of righteousness who speak evil and not good of them and who rebuke them for their sins as openly as these sins are committed. The Lord reads the motives of every heart. He will incline his ear to hear the prayer of the contrite heart. But those who would silence God's true messengers, that they may no more be annoyed by their reproofs, he will permit to go on in the way of their own choosing. He will take from them the privilege of having their errors pointed out. No prophecy will awaken them from their carnal security. No warnings will put them to shame or lead them to repentance. This paragraph is a fearful pronouncement. No prophecy, no warning, no direction. Is this not showing what it means to see the withdrawal of the Holy Spirit? Now go. Write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people. These are lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, see not, and to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things. Speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits, get you out of the way, turn aside out of the path, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. Isaiah 30, 8 to 11. Yeah, I think we're living right there. Amen. God saw that the spirit of rebellion manifested by ancient Israel would increase in after ages. Therefore, he directed that his warnings be written in a book as a testimony against them forever. The professed people of God have used their influence against what God sent through his chosen agencies. Men who have linked 
with the world in spirit and practice have endeavored to turn the people from truth and righteousness. The messengers which God has sent, reproving their backslidings and warning them of their false security, they have despised. They would use any device to cause this admin, adminatory voice to be hushed and words to be spoken which would foster their pride, encourage their presumption, and soothe the conscience into a false peace. Their effort is to turn the true messenger of God from the path of duty and silence the voice of warning, while they, professing godliness, shall mingle with the world in spirit and practice and at the same time be honored as Christian leaders, but to keep the fear and the honor and judgment of God before them fills them with hatred. They do not want to bear his holy character, his hatred for sin, for they practice dishonesty. They cry, prophesy smooth things, talk of the love of Jesus. Do not keep before us the just, justice of God. Remember, this was written 16 years before Mrs. White passed. What is she showing us here? They, that these people, these children of God with hard hearts, would prefer to talk of the love of Jesus, don't keep before us the justice of God. Why tell us of his coming judgment? Just tell us that he loves us. Do we not see this occurring all around us today? Uh, thus saith the Lord gives great displeasure to their proud, worldly, reprobate minds. They despise the words of the Lord that the word they despise the words the Lord sends them, and are resolved to pursue the way which seems right to them, to trust in oppression, trust in deceit and perversity. Therefore, their iniquity shall be to them as a breach ready to fail, excuse me, a breach ready to fall, swelling out in a high wa wall, whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. Hypocrisy is peculiar, <clears throat> peculiarly offensive to God. A large majority of the men and women who profess to know the truth prefer smooth messages. They do not desire to have their sins and their defects brought before them. They want accommodating ministers who will not arouse conviction by speaking the truth. They choose men who will flatter them. And in their turn, they flatter the minister who has shown such a good spirit while they revile the faithful servant of God. Great efforts are made in this age to induce ministers to leave the straightforward path of truth and holiness in order to sustain a wrong course of action. Many praise the minister who dwells on the grace and mercy and love of Jesus, who is not particular to enforce duties and obligations, who does not warn of the danger of hypocrisy or present the terrors of God's wrath. The Lord's work is earnest and it is decided above deceit and above hypocrisy. His true shepherds will not praise and exalt man. They will come before the people with a plain, thus saith the Lord, the Holy One of Israel. Isaiah 45, 11. They will bear his message, whether men will hear or whether they will forbear. If men despise God's word, 
and trust in oppression, in hypocrisy, in worldliness, they must declare against them God's denunciations, so that if possible, they may be aroused to repentance. If they are too proud to repent and confess their errors, to turn to God, welcoming his salvation and seeking his favor, the Lord will remove his light from them and will leave them to walk in the way that they have chosen. Those who drive the Lord's faithful messengers into corners, who discourage them, who stand between them and the people, that their message may not have the influence God designed it should, are answerable for the deceptions and the heresies come into the church as a result of their course. They have a fearful account to render to God. After the Lord has repeatedly warned his people, and they still refuse to hearken to his voice and will not be instructed, their guilt becomes particularly abhorrent to him. The record of their rebellion is written in a book before him, and will confront them when the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened. Any thoughts or comments on what we've just read? I believe we've also read that when we come to the condition where the Lord has turned away from us, that we won't, in many cases, even recognize it. Right. Agreed. That's, that's pretty scary, too. Because the Holy Spirit won't be speaking to us. You know, I find a lot of these previously unpublished documents to be very pointed yet very necessary for our growth at this time check the chat at this time when we have in the movement those that seek to silence voices that are choosing to ask questions, when they are seeking separation rather than unity, when they are seeking theories instead of the word of God, this is how this document applies to the movement today. In the blessing being received, in being able to go back over the old corn from the Oklahoma camp meeting of 2010, there were many things that were being addressed at that time. There were many voices at that time joining into giving the proclamation of this message. Many of those voices have now willfully chosen to become silent of the validity of this message. Many of those voices chose a different path because they did not believe that the way that Elder Jeff was being led was correct. Some of those voices confronted him scant years later with instruction from Protestant commentaries regarding the book of Joel. That's the no. answer, bro. That's the no. answer to that question. Sure, exactly. 
very much the answer to that question. But what I'm ref what I'm giving reference to is a direct example to see exactly what was happening. Today within the movement, we have those that would prefer not being questioned on the positions that they're taking. In any presentation that I am led to give, I welcome questions. I may not have all the answers. I may not have any answer. Yet, the words that were spoken by the prophet, whether we're talking Amos, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, or Mrs. White, are as valid today as they were at the time in which they were written. We're going to have a little bit of recap from last week. But again, we have an unpublished document. And this was letter 52 of 1901. When you say that unpublished document, you mean up until 2015. Correct. Yes, I do. Many of these unpublished documents have additional references on additional copies that are, again, still yet unpublished. The only way we have to look at these is to go back to the White Estate, seek entrance, and then read these for ourselves. The state of the world today is represented by the state of the world in Noah's day. Our transgressions are multiplied before thee and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, concerning and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the streets, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth falleth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Isaiah 59, 12 to 15. The entire purpose of these portions of the study relate directly to what we have been studying from Zechariah. For Mrs. White gave a very pointed comment that the state of the world at the end of time was represented by these verses that we have been studying. To know that the state of the world, the condition of the world today, is the same as was the state of the world in Noah's day, is a fearful enough pronouncement. But to know that, we, that this is represented by the state of the world in Noah's day, where we have had much greater light even than that of Noah is absolutely amazing. This is the condition of the world today and those who are so confused in their estimate of truth and righteousness as to seek wisdom and praise and glory from men are receiving all they will ever have unless they repent and are converted. 
How does that relate to us today? Consider this carefully, brothers and sisters. If we are unwilling to repent, can we ever be converted? Negative. What is the condition in the world today? Is not faith in the Bible as effectually destroyed by the higher criticism and speculation of today as it was by tradition and rabbianism in the days of Christ? Have not greed and ambition and love of pleasure as strong a hold on men's hearts now as it did then? In the professedly Christian world, even in the professed churches of Christ, how few are governed by Christian principles in business, social, domestic, even religious circles. How few make the teachings of Christ the rule of daily living. Is it not true that justice standeth afar off, equity cannot enter, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey? Isaiah 59, 14 and 15. We are living in the midst of an epidemic of crime at which thoughtful God-fearing God men everywhere stand aghast. Okay, we're going to stop. We're going to answer a question from the chat. I open this to the floor. The question is this. What about when we repent and again sin against our God again and again? I'll give a testimony. There had been sin in my life for a very long time. There is sin all the way around me. I got to the point where I was so sick of sin that in prayer, I ask how I was to do this and how I could surrender all. Only by one 100% consecration of the heart to God and letting him fight for me against the sin can the sin be overcome and this would be answered by the study last night right so I mean we we are to have a fight a battle with self but we don't fight alone and we don't focus upon the law we focus upon christ the law in christ right station of the law and the reason why we sin and repent is because we're looking at self we're trusting to self. We're trusting in our own power rather than in Christ's strength. Yeah. Now, the question, of course, might be, you know, there are many people who constantly sin and repent in quotation marks. I mean, that would be sort of the, even the Catholic idea that you just, as long as you just keep confessing your sins, you can continue to go on sinning. But um, the struggle that we face is to take our eyes off self, to trust in God's righteousness, what he says in his word of what he is going to accomplish, and, and focus upon that rather than upon 
am I right with God in the sense, you know, can I stop from sinning in my own eyes? Uh, because the 144,000 have no remembrance of sins, and yet they have uh, a sense of their own unworthiness. They're not, they're not presenting their righteousness to God. And often that's what people are doing. And that's why we compare ourselves with others. So Joan's study from yesterday, uh, number 18, I think is one of the, the most powerful in that, that uh, series of lectures. But it does take faith. Can I just add, sorry, Theodore, go on. I just wanted to add something if you're done. If you're not, just go on. I'm done. Okay, Psalm 139, 23, and 24 have been two major ver verses in my life that have helped me to change and keep changing. And they say, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. So it's like preventing. It's like, so, Lord, please prevent me from acting on my own impulses or my own carnal vindictiveness or whatever the sin the, or the preponderance to a certain sin may be. And I find that helps a lot with the confession, repentance, confession, and you keep repeating the same thing. I just, like Dwight, I just got so sick of it. I'm just saying, Lord, please stop me from reacting the way my normal, my natural self would react, which is pretty horrible. So Psalm 139, 23, and 24, like if what I've done sometimes, if I have a, a besetment in my life that I really want to get rid of, I start to claim a whole lot of verses on that. And it's, it's miraculous. Thank you. I hope that, that this helps to answer the question that was being asked. Yeah, did Samuel, how did that work for Samuel? Okay. We are living in the midst of an epidemic of crime that which thoughtful, God-fearing men everywhere stand aghast. The corruption that prevails, it is beyond the power of the human pen to describe. Every day brings fresh revelations of political strife, of bribery, and of fraud. Every day brings its heart-sickening record of violence and lawlessness, of indifference to human suffering, of brutal, fiendish destruction of human life. Every day testifies to the increase of insanity, to the increase of murder and of suicide. Who can doubt that satanic agencies are at work among men with increasing activity to distract and corrupt the mind and defile and destroy the body? And while the world is filled with these evils, the gospel is too often presented in such an indifferent manner as to make but little impression upon the conscious or the lives of men. Everywhere there are hearts crying out for something which they have not. They long for a power that will give them mastery over sin, a power that will deliver them from the bondage of evil, a power that will give health and life and peace. Many who once knew the power of God's word have dwelt where there is no recognition of God and they long for, the, for that divine presence. The world needs today what it needed 1,900 years ago, a revelation of Christ. A great work of reform is demanded, and it is only through the grace of Christ that the work of restoration, physical, mental, and spiritual, can be accomplished. This work of restoration 
in the physical, the mental, and the spiritual. Can we not see that this is, again, a three-step testing process? For are we not to give a three-step prophetic testing message to the world? So that man may be restored in his relationship with his creator? It requires all, 100% of the person, the physical, the mental, and the spiritual person to be able to achieve the restoration in communion with God. The true Christian can have no fellowship with the world where judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off, where truth is fallen in the streets and equity cannot enter. And he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. Isaiah 59, 14 and 15. The Christian represents a truth that works counter to all the ambitious plans of the world. This is why the world hates the followers of Christ. The world loves the Christian that is not the true Christian. The world hates the Christian that exposes those that are not truly following Christ. This is a picture of what exists today. Justice is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. Isaiah 59, 14 and 15. Even the church, which should be the pillar and ground of the truth, is found encouraging a selfish love of pleasure. Is that the way this is supposed to be? Are we supposed to see this in the church or the movement at this time? Yet is thus, as Mrs. White is pointing out, is this not what we're finding? Where money is raised for religious purposes, to what means do many churches resort? to bazaars, to suppers, to fancy fairs, even to lotteries and similar devices. Often the place set apart for God's worship is desecrated by feasting and drinking. It is desecrated in buying and selling and merrymaking. Respect for the house of God and reverence for his worship are lessened in the minds of the youth. The barriers of self-restraint are weakened selfishness, appetite, the love of display are appealed to, and they strengthen as they are indulged. Is this not the way it is with sin? Once we begin to re that we begin to drop those barriers of self-restraint, is it not easier and easier? to do that same sin over and over again. Isaiah 59, 16. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness, it sustained him. Men may face courageously a grave peril and become cowards in meeting petty annoyances. 
Satan knows how to prepare his temptations in such a way that they will wear upon the nerves and irritate the temper and cause men to lose their self-control. Satan triumphs when he can use to do this work men who claim to be Christ's chosen servants. He delights to make men who are professing to keep the commandments of God his agents in breaking these commandments. But men who become his agents do not love God supremely or their neighbors as themselves. They do not give evidence that they love one another as Christ has loved them. They have lost sight of their leader and are following another teacher, following another leader who directs them to bruise and wound the souls of those who need their help. If we are not standing under the banner of Prince Emmanuel, then we stand under the black banner of the great apostate. Is this not clear at this time? Your only course is to lean your whole weight upon Christ. Is this not the point that was being made in last night's study? Do we not see that we need complete and total commitment leaning our entire weight upon Christ? Ever bear in mind that we are now upon trial. Is the trial to be sometime in the future? What is she saying here? We are to keep it in mind that we are now upon trial. In this life, we are to form a character either after the divine similitude or after the similitude of the rebellious one who lost his glorious estate and forfeited his exalted position in the heavenly courts. You have experienced what it means to have no arm reached out in tender Christ-like pity and compassion. And you also know that his own arm wrought salvation. Isaiah 59, 16. <clears throat> Christ invites you to wear his yoke, to lift his burden, and he says, Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Matthew eleven twenty nine. There is one thing which you will always be safe in doing, and that is in loving God supremely and in loving your fellow men. Your hardest conflict will come in making a success of keeping the straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. In order to do this, you must die daily. You will meet with prejudice. You will meet with opposition. If you are seeking to serve God, you will meet with treatment that will be contrary to your natural disposition. Paul said, I die daily. Do not become provoked when you suffer wrongfully. Hold fast your integrity in Christ Jesus. This next section comes from Southern Watchmen. 15th of May of 1906. In Eden, men fell from his high estate and through transgression became subject to death. It was seen in heaven that human beings were perishing 
and the compassion of God was stirred. At infinite cost, he devised a, mean of re a means of relief. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. John 3.16 There was no hope for the transgressor except through Christ. <clears throat> God saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness, it sustained him. The Lord chose a people and made them de the depositories of his truth. It was his purpose that by the revelation of his character through Israel, men should be drawn to him. To all the world, the gospel invitation was to be given. Through the teachings of the sacrificial service, Christ was to be uplifted before the nations, and all who would look upon him should live. But Israel did not fulfill God's purpose. They forgot God and lost sight of their high privilege as his representatives. The blessings that they had received brought no blessing to the world. All their advantages were appropriated for their own glorification. They robbed God of the service he required of them. And they robbed their fellow men of religious guidance and a holy example. Do we not see this occurring today? Has this not been occurring since the church was founded in 1863? Isaiah 59, 17. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a, as a cloak. The condition of the world at the time of Christ is well described by the prophet Isaiah. He says that the people were found transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. And judgment is turned away backward and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and an helmet of salvation upon his head. How many times did Mrs. White need to repeat this and show this as the condition of not only the world, but the church? Is she not giving a warning message to prepare for the judgment of God? Is she not showing here clearly the messages of Revelation 14? Mm. Now, I find it interesting when I'm doing my preparation. 
that the translators of the Bible gave reference to a portion from the Apocrypha. The Book of Wisdom, the Wisdom of Sirach, verses 5, 18, and 19 dovetail well with the, the comments that Paul makes in Ephesians. In wisdom we read, he shall put on righteousness as a breastplate and true judgment instead of a helmet. He shall take holiness for an invincible shield. And in Ephesians, Paul writes, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. In the book of Isaiah, in the book of wisdom, and in the book of Ephesians, we have three witnesses to exactly the same point. The condition of the world previous to the first appearing of Christ is a picture of the condition of the world just previous to the second advent. The same iniquity will exist. Satan manifests the same delusive power upon the minds of men. He is setting his trained agents at work and moving them to intense activity. He is securing his army of human agents to engage in the last conflict against the Prince of Life, <clears throat> to overthrow the, throne, the law of God, which is the foundation of his throne. The law is the foundation of the throne of God. Does this not give the picture that if the attempt is made to change the law, then you must make the attempt to change the throne. Is not the throne of God eternal? For is not the law of God eternal? Satan will work with miraculous presentations to confirm men in their belief that he is what he claims to be, the prince of this world, and that victory is his. He will turn his forces against those who are loyal to God. But though he may cause pain, distress, and human agony, he cannot defile the soul. He may cause affliction to the people of God as he did to Christ but he cannot cause one of Christ's little ones to perish. The people of God in these last days must expect to enter into the thick of the conflict. For the prophetic word says, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation twelve seventeen. Isaiah 59, 18. According to their deeds, accordingly he will say, fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, and to the islands he will, re he will repay recompense. Now, in the alternate reading, we wind up with recompenses and then recompense repeated twice. What can we derive from this? What can we see here with this? I see a doubling. Agreed. What is being said by recompense? Uh, payback. Okay. Is there anything else that we see here? Uh, 
if we look at the word Hebrew 1576, Gamul, we find that this is from the Hebrew 1580 treatment, that is an act of good or of ill by implication, service, or requital. As has served, benefited, deserted, deserving, that which he hath given, which is his reward. According to their rewards, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, rewards to his enemies, to the islands, he will, he will repay rewards. We would have to look at this. We would have to look at the different verses, 19 different verses that said to be related to this with recompense. That reminds me of the text that says uh, the wages of sin is death. Right. That's a Not reward, quite. right? Agreed. But I find it really interesting because the first time that this word is used in the Bible would take us to Judges 9.16. Now, therefore, if ye have done truly and sincerely in that ye have made Abimelech king, and if ye have dealt well with Jerubal and his house and have done unto him according to the, to the deserving, the reward of his hands, was this not spoken by the one brother of Abimelech that survived the slaughter? Right, right, yeah. Yeah, so Jotham, who represents uh, the 70th week. Isn't it interesting how this comes right back so that we may look upon the 70th week, the close of this period of probation. that was given to the people during the time of the judges. Okay, we are close to our time for today. Are there any other thoughts or comments with what we have just covered? One verse that comes to me, which has, to me anyway, more of a joyous tint or whatever you want to call it. Now, Luke 6, 38 it says, given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Okay. Thank you. Any other thoughts or comments? Shall we then close with prayer? <laughs> Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for these admonitions that you have provided. We thank you for this time that we have been able to spend together. We ask your blessing, Father, through the rest of this Sabbath. <clears throat> Be with Brother Steve Welk as he gives presentation today. Help us each one that we may study for ourselves to show ourselves approved unto God. Unto you from whom all blessings come. 
be with us each. Help us so that we may assemble again together to learn more of that which you would have us to know. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.